In 1296, Zhao Dugan was part of a Chinese diplomatic mission that travelled to the city of Angkor Wat, the centre of the Khmer Empire, which at the time was the dominant power of Southeast Asia. The city was designed to replicate the cosmic world, a celestial order inspired by Indian religious belief. Zhao remained at Angkor Wat for 11 months and after returning to China wrote of his observations of the Khmer capital. What follows is based on his account, although I did not follow in his footsteps. Our countries have known of each other since ancient times, but only our empire has the mandate from heaven to encompass the world. Some of our previous envoys to Cambodia never returned. We sailed south by southwest past Fujian, Guangdong, Henan, and the East Sea to Champa on Vietnam's central coast. From there, another 15 days to Vang Tau, then on to the Mekong Delta and northwards along these waterways to Kampong. Ten more days travel brought us to Tonle Sap Lake. Arriving at a great city, we found five gateways surrounded by a huge moat. We were greeted by fearsome-looking statues grasping nine-headed snakes. The city gates opened in the morning and closed at night. They were guarded. Neither dogs nor criminals could enter. A golden tower stood at the centre of the city. It was surrounded by more than 20 stone towers and over 100 stone chambers. Rows of eight gold Buddhas stood at the base of the stone chambers. To the east was a golden bridge flanked by two golden lions. 500 meters north of the golden tower was an even taller bronze one. The king's residence was located 500 meters north of this tower. Yet another golden tower stood in his compound. Angkor Wat was about 2,500 meters north of the city. It had a square tower, dozens of stone chambers, a gold Buddha, a golden lion, bronze elephant, an ox, and a horse. I was prohibited from entering. The king slept in a golden temple and made love with a nine-headed snake each evening. After that, he entertained his queen or the royal concubines. All members of society wore their hair in a bun and were clothed only with a piece of cloth wrapped around the waist. Only the king could wear cloth printed with a floral pattern. Sometimes he wore a string of flowers in place of his crown. The king's finery included a pearl necklace, gold bracelets and rings on all his fingers. He walked barefoot through the palace. The soles of his feet were dyed red. There were three religions, Brahmins, Buddhists and ascetics. The Brahmins were scholars who served the government. Buddhist monks shaved their heads and wore saffron robes. They ate meat and fish, but did not drink wine. The king consults them on matters of state. There are no nuns in the temple. 
Ascetics dress like ordinary people except for a distinctive headcloth. They worship a piece of stone. No one can watch them eat. The people of the south, other remote places and alleyways are coarse, ugly and black. The palace women, however, are fair-skinned because they avoid the sunlight. They present themselves barefoot and bare-breasted. Even the king's wives appear so. The king has five wives, one is superior. There are also up to 5,000 concubines and maids. They rarely go out. All the palace women wear gold bracelets and rings. Both men and women often wear perfume. High officials speak their own language, scholars another, monks yet another, and the city and rural people have their own separate dialects. Writing is done on the hide of deer or other animals. All writing is from black back to front rather than from top to bottom. There are people who know about astronomy and calculate celestial events. All practice Buddhism. The country has many transvestites. There are indigenous wild men who live in the mountains. Of these there are two types. One is sold into slavery, the other is nomadic and resists domestication. They are looked down upon. Wild ones marry only among themselves. The king litigates disputes between ordinary people. He holds audiences twice a day. Those who wish to see him sit in a line on the ground and wait. Music and the sound of a conch signal the king's arrival. Two women unfurl a blind to reveal the king standing inside a golden window holding a golden sword. The audience bows. The king sits. When business is done, the king turns around and the women lower the blind. In some matters, ordinary people can detain and discipline wrongdoers. I have been told that the native women are lustful. A husband who cannot satisfy his wife will be abandoned by her, as will one who leaves his home for an extended period of time. Native women insert salted hot rice into their vaginas after giving birth. This is to prevent infection and shrink the vagina. When ill, people immerse themselves in water. Skin diseases are common and may be attributable to the climate. Men and women bathe after sex. This, I believe, causes them to catch dysentery. Local medicines are found in the markets. Shamans and sorcerers also perform absurd healing rituals. Dead people are placed on a mat and wrapped with cloth. Funeral processions are accompanied by flags, drums and music. The body is taken outside the city and left for the vultures. It disappears quite quickly. A partly eaten corpse signifies unworthiness. Some people are cremated. The king's body is placed in a tower. The country is unspeakably hot, so the people bathe regularly in the river. Men and women bathe together naked. Sometimes city women also come to the river. There can be thousands of them. Even the noble women come naked. We used to like to go and watch. Some of us hoped to get lucky because the people are so friendly and sweet-natured. Finding the country so agreeable, Many of our Chinese sailors deserted us here. There is a wet season and the dry season. Four harvests a year are possible. Human manure is not used. 
A pit is dug as a toilet and covered with straw. They wash themselves afterward. The people mocked our use of toilet paper. The country consists of forests, jungles and wetlands. Rice and sugarcane grow in treeless fields where wild oxen wander. The variety of birds and animals is infinite. There are mountains all around. They are covered with strange trees. Rhinoceros and elephants live in treeless fields. There is green onion, mustard, leek, watermelon, cucumber and gourds, cardamom, yellow gum and chow mugra oil. There is abundant fish life in Tonle Sap Lake, black carp being the most common. There are, there are also many varieties of saltwater fish, as well as turtles, lizards and crocodiles. Many types of trees and fruit that do not exist in China are found here. These include pomegranates, sugarcane and bananas. There are peacocks, kingfishers, parrots, vultures, crows, sparrows, herons, crane, cormorants and ducks. Food is covered with a cloth. The people use clay cauldrons to cook rice and clay pots to cook soup. These are cooked over a fire. Rich houses use utensils of silver and gold. There is much trade in Chinese gold, silver and silk. Chinese pewter, paper, umbrellas, wax beads, fine tooth combs and needles are popular. Women do all the buying and selling. A foreigner must find a woman to do his bidding for him. Business takes place in a market between dawn and midday. There are no shops. Goods are instead placed on a mat on the ground. Small goods are traded for rice. Larger goods for copper coins and for big business, trading is with gold and silver. See that oh, here? Um, that one. This one here? This one? Yeah. Well, well that's about it. Yeah. We have arrived. Little table outside here on the courtyard balcony, overlooking the street. And let's have a look in here. Open the door. Here's my room. I wish it was a coffee grinder. No, it's a hairdryer. Two glasses of water. Refrigerator. And the washroom. I've been coming here for almost two years. About every three months. They really treat me very well. Here's my balcony here. And my cup of coffee. Shall I have the coffee?